I must say I've learned a lot about fishing and a bit about lures. I've fished with racket shads, thin fins, poppers, bombers, Darwin darts, bass hunters, and even a thunder stick and a bumper bar. <laughs> What's with lures, Gary? Oh, it's a bewildering array of lures. Uh, the main thing with lures is that you've got one to suit each application. And that's, that is, you need a surface lure, be it a popper uh, or any other surface plug. Uh, you need a subsurface lure, one that'll run around about mid-depth and one that'll sink to the bottom. And so those three is what, what you need to uh, apply to just about every situation, whether it's along the coast or in the river system. Looks like they're designed to catch fishermen as much as fish. Yeah, huh? there's that too. Now this is a pitcher plant. It could be called a jug plant. It's shaped like an old-fashioned jug, which they called a pitcher. Now, there's only one species in Australia. Most of them are found in Borneo. And in fact, one of them over there is big enough to hold a half a litre of digestive fluid. And they've actually found a rat in one. It's a true carnivorous plant. The pitcher is not a flower. It's actually an extension of a leaf. Amazingly enough, nutrients from the leaf not so much from the roots. Now this is what the flower looks like. So you can see that the pitcher is not the flower. It's actually the end of the leaf. Rob, over the years I've found heaps of mosquito larvae in there. And I think it's the Anopheles mosquito larvae. That's the malaria mosquito. Mm -hmm. But there's also a blowfly maggot in there. One only. A maggot. Yeah. It's just quite amazing that it survives in that enzyme at the bottom of the plant. What I ought to do is just open one up and show you. Well, there's the mosquito larvae, and there's the maggot. And oh, there's the maggot. One only. Quite active, too. Yeah. Yeah, see all those little black uh, spots in there, yeah. uh, Robbie? That's where the digestive enzymes are released from the plant. <coughs> Okay. Well, we've finally made it. This is Somerset. This is where 130 odd years ago there was to be a new Singapore. All that's left is a few cannons and a few monuments. Well, he's still here, isn't he? Well, that's the monument that Frank's and his wife buried here. Yeah. That's Frank and that's his wife. Yeah, it's hard to um, put a perspective on how the first Europeans must have felt, you know, when they first arrived in this yeah, part of the world. Yeah, this um, area here was heavily populated by Aboriginal people when they established the first outpost here. 
And the only evidence, or cultural evidence, of existence here is in these caves just up around the headland. What's amazing to me is the sea comes up in and yet the paintings are so well preserved. Too much stuff in it, like. No. You might be wondering why I'm looking for a snake under sheep and stuff. Well, this is the wet season here and you might notice it's quite dry under here so like any animal they look for somewhere it's a bit drier and you might have noticed quite a few little geckos running around that's food for them in fact a lot of mad made things are excellent for snakes they even like getting in the rafters of the houses because the frogs get up in there and live up there so if you want to find a snake The best places to go is where there's a lot of rubbish. They like it. Big centipede over here, look at this. That's quite a big centipede. The big ones are usually females. He's trying to bury away again. Now most animals, if you don't try and pin them down or something, just think you're part of the woodwork, so you can pick up most animals like this. Don't seem to worry too much. Off you go. Nothing in there. Now this is a really good spot here because the sheets are tinned on top of each other. There's a little lizard going in there too. Skin. It's a bit of skin. It's a python skin, I'd say children's python. See by the narrow belly scales. And very small scales on its back. Huh. Very surprised about that. Just look at here, the numbers of eggs under here that have been hatched. Look at them. Here. A scorpion. The things you find where human habitation is. Here's a little scorpion. 
monkey guy, come on. And he thinks I'm a part of the woodwork. You might notice he's a very flat one. He's one that lives on trees. Very reluctant to bite, as you can see, trying to hide. Lovely little white tip on his tail. Yeah. <laughs> a bit warm doing this, but we've just found what we call a gecko nursery. There's just heaps and heaps of eggshells here from where the geckos have all hatched. They must love this spot. And there's a heap of good eggs over here. Man, ain't all bad. They like our habitation. Here we have a huntsman spider. There are lots and lots of different kinds of huntsmen all over Australia. Come on, if you go. <laughs> Can't he hide quick, eh? Okay, go, if you go, mate. Okay. There he goes. This is a baby of those geckos that I found the eggs for. The bionose gecko, and it's what they call parthenogenic, the female doesn't need a male. In fact, they've never found a male. So the female lays fertile eggs. <laughs> Cute little devil, isn't he? <laughs> That's the mummy. Oh, now this is an adult binos gecko. Now if it was like other geckos, the male would have two large protuberances under the tail where the genitals are kept. I don't know if you can see it, but through her skin on her belly, you can actually see a white shape. That's an egg inside of her stomach. It's not that well developed, so it's harder to see. Just in front of the fingers, you can see a pale white thing. That's an egg right there. Okay, here's another three of those geckos, and they're all females. And in one of them, you can really see the eggs really well. She's got two in the stomach. More skin. Really on the right track now. Those geckos are food for them. Children's python from the skin that we found. Children's pythons are a very small type of a python. In fact, this is an adult. Doesn't mean that children can play with them. It's just that the person that actually discovered them, his name was Children's, so it was named after him. It's quite ironic in a way. We've had our little look-see now. We'll put him back. Off you go, mate. Come on. You can have a drink now, look. Where you gonna go now? Yippee! <laughs> what a beauty! He's a nice one, isn't he? You watch this. <laughs> Cranky little devil. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> It's all right. Now this is a black-headed python. He's a cannibal. He eats other snakes. In fact, he's immune to all other snakes. Now all other pythons in Australia, other than this one and a desert one, which is very similar, have heat sensors on their mouths, and he doesn't. So he's designed basically cold-blooded animals, other snakes and even goannas. Yeah, they, I found them hissing and carrying on, but they. They, uh, and they will strike at you. Yeah. They've got very, very strong mouths too. If they do bite and hang on, they're hard to get off. Mm. But must... as with most snakes, you really got to hurt them before they'll actually bite you. You've got to stand on it, try and catch it like I'm doing now, or kill it. But I'm pretty gentle with him. I'm letting him go a little bit. I'm not holding him tight. I'm letting him crawl so he feels like he's free. Yeah. And that's one thing with a snake. If you grab him and don't let him go, then they might come around and bite you. Now a lot of people think snakes are really, really fast, but they're not, they're really slow because they've got no legs. And if we put him on the ground, let him go for a bit of a walk, and he's gonna go off, because he's, he's annoyed, he's actually running now, that's a running python, but I can actually walk, walk and beat him, a yeah. running python. Mm. 
the pythons are reasonably slow. Amazing creatures, aren't they? Look he goes. If you keep on that road, boy, you're going to get run over. <laughs> now, if you ever have to catch a python, never grab it in the middle of the body like that because he can come around and bite you. He didn't want to. Always grab them behind there gently first and then you can actually free handle them once they see you're not really a threat to them. Now this is a scrub python. It's a member of the boa and anaconda family and can grow to more than six meters long. In fact, a friend of mine reliably measured one of these at eight meters. That's around 27 feet. And this one, long, slender python, he's actually a tree climber. And boy, can he climb. One of their favourite foods are feline foxes, and that's how they get up the tree, concertina style. It's just magic, look at it. I thought it'd be interesting, now we've seen how a python climbs a tree, to see how a tree snake climbs a tree. He's got a specialised belly scale with a right angle and he just hooks into a little crack he can and he goes straight up. Now they're often called a green tree snake and they're not always green, they can be black blue, yellow, brown. Now they're a very common snake up the east coast of Australia from about Sydney and right around to the Kimberleys in Western Australia. Up he goes, look at him go. You really have to annoy them to make them bite. And they've got very, very fine teeth. If they bite, hardly draws blood. Here he goes. No blood. Yeah, there's some big skinks here, some real big skinks here. How deep is he? He's just in that little corner, just in there. I'm surprised I can't get a here. Almost. It's all rotten, this tree. So. Yeah, you know, Soft all I mean, just by looking what I saw, he looked like a giant tree toad skin. Got a long slender with a long body. I've just arrived here. here I've got him. Hey, amazing. I'd like to yeah. figure out that. I haven't seen one of these yeah, ever before. Tail. See the long tail on it? Unreal. Yeah, that's a long tail skin. Yeah. yeah. They're long tail. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're pretty common. Is what it's they're common enough here. They're called long tail skins here. Yep. You don't know any other name for them? No, it? that's all we have called them, Rob. Long tail skins. You see the length of the tail and proportions of the oh, yeah, It's huge. Quite, quite long. Yeah. Well, it's actually almost like the, the legless lizard, only this one's got legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we take his legs, it won't hit me a legless lizard. Yeah. Beautiful specimen, isn't it? Look what we've got here. The granddaddy of tree frogs. <laughs> a white lipped tree frog. Ah, look at that. Giant tree frog. The other day I was poked around the bush and I found a green tree frog in a log. There's a big green tree frog living in this little hole. You can see what he says when I annoy him. Oh, leave me alone. It's <laughs> <laughs> like amazing, you're talking yeah. about anything. <laughs> anyway, this is the giant tree frog. 
Yeah, they get to be some size. Yeah, he's basically what got the grand dagger. This bloke's sort of tucked up though. In the wild, they don't eat as much as what they do around the houses or <laughs> habitation. He wants to go back home to bed. He wants to go back. <laughs> okay, mate, settle down. Settle down. Yeah, this is the giant tree frog, and he grows the biggest of them all. Yeah, they get and to he's be some size. Readily distinguishable from his little cousin because he's got that white lip and he's got a much smoother and brighter green skin. Actually a mate of mine had a theory if, if you don't like a tree frog in your house you actually you take him away and you throw him back at the house. <laughs> <laughs> so he thinks he's got to go back that way. <laughs> I don't know if it works. <laughs> I don't think it would. <laughs> This big butterfly is one of the birdwing species and they abound in North Queensland, Cape York to New Guinea and I think this is one of the biggest ones they have, we have in Australia. They're extremely beautiful as you can see and this is a male. The females are quite different coloured. They're basically black and white with the same red on the sail and the same nice tail and they're much bigger than this fellow too. Oops. Here's a female. Look at the size of that. It's not a snake, it's a Burton's legless lizard. Now there are about 30 species of them and what's truly amazing is they're totally unique to Australia with two species slipping across to New Guinea. Now even though it's shaped like a snake, has the skin of a skink, it actually belongs to the gecko family. Now this is a female and she's pregnant. She's got two large eggs in her body. Having large eggs means she's going to have large babies, which gives them a better chance of survival. And it's this, this particular species is almost all over Australia. Anyway, we better get them off the road. I've just rescued this little fellow from the Seisha campground amenities block. He got trapped in there chasing moths attracted to the light. It's a Papuan frogmouth, and you can see why they call it a frogmouth from the size of its mouth. <laughs> now, this is one of a small group of birds that is a reminder for how close to New Guinea we really are. They only occur in Cape York and New Guinea. Now it's very similar to the one everyone knows, the tawny frogmouth. Main differences, it's about twice the size and it's got this really bright orange or red eye. Now their food is just about anything, a frog, a reptile, a little mammal or an insect that can fit down that throat. And a lot of people think it's a kind of an owl, but it's not. It's more closely related to the kookaburras. In fact, kills its prey by bashing it just like they do. And it's got the same feet as a kookaburra. All right, mate, settle down. It's OK, we're going to let you go in just one minute. I'm going to let him go now, but so he won't fly off and bash himself against a tree, I'm going to blindfold him. And that tends to quieten down birds. Then I'll just take the blindfold off. Get your tail on that side. OK, settle down, settle down, settle down. I'm not going to sit out there, okay. Got his feet on there, hasn't he? Yes. Oh, he must have bite me. Okay, settle down. Settle down, settle down. Alan, that's it, that's it, that's the one. 